I'm joined now by Matt Bottomley, the analyst from Canaccord Genuity. Matt, welcome back. How are you doing, James? Great, thanks. How are you doing? Good, thanks. Good. Um, so tell me, Matt, what is there in the cannabis space that's really got your attention this week? Well, there's, it's been a busy few weeks, uh, particularly on the, the M&A side. So we saw a, not a small deal, but it's sort of a tuck-in deal that uh, Hexo, I keep wanting to call them Hydropothecary, but mm. uh, I think it's an easier name anyways, that Hexo did. So they bought New Strike in a 200 million plus deal. Um, that kind of gave them some more, uh, I think some more provincial distribution, some more fish, uh, fish hooks out there to try and get their, their product, which is selling very, very well in Quebec, into other markets. Uh, it gets them some indoor cultivation as well, which uh, as you know, is very important if you want to eventually uh, export into Germany or other international markets. Typically, those markets call for EU GMP certification, and it's right. you know it's almost impossible to get that in a greenhouse. So, adding some indoor cultivation helps that. Um, but what was very interesting about that deal, in terms of my read through from it, was it was bought for almost no premium on New Strike, uh, and that's nothing to speak you know on, on a ne from a negative standpoint on, on New Strike as a company. But I think it goes to show similar to last time when I was here and we were chatting that if you're not a leader in the space, and I consider Hexo to be one of those sort of top five names in the space, um, there's not a lot of market share left out there, at least in this first year. So in order to make use of your you know, indoor cultivation facilities that are all over, uh, all over Canada and some of these other names that are public companies, but still not in that top five, it might make sense to pair off, pair off with, uh, with another larger producer. We're able to take their paper in exchange and then you know, grow with them as opposed to try and battle in what will eventually be a commoditizing market. So the no premium uh, in the takeout bid, as well as uh, the fact that um, I think that most of the market share is going to be going to the canopies and the like of, uh, of the sector, uh, tells me that I think that there could be a huge crunch with some of these, for lack of a better term, tier two producers in the space in Canada. Wow. Um, a lot of the shareholders of New Strike voice their uh, concern, their opposition to the idea of there not being a premium because that's sort of the expectation in you know, capital markets generally is mm -hmm. that if somebody takes you out, there's got to be a premium and mm -hmm. it's usually around 20% if, if things are well. So you're suggesting that they should be happy because just having the privilege of riding alongside Hexos or Hexos success with Hexo shares should more than offset whatever short-term discount right. they didn't or premium they didn't receive. Yeah, I don't have a view one way or another. I didn't cover um, New Strike before this on whether there should have been a premium baked in or not, but I think it does highlight the risk that it's very unlikely that there's a competitive bid process out there for many of these, again, tier two producers, right. uh, if they're able to get an offer in at, at that level. So I think it definitely might make sense to for some producers, whether it's Hexo or others, to take a smaller premium now if they're hitched to a wagon that's someone that could potentially be a leader uh, in the sector overall and Hexo has about 30% market share in Quebec and part of this deal is to help them branch out uh, their overall market share which I think is 10% if you do a weighted average on every state um, you know uh, you know it's sort of the you know a plus B equals you know synergies right so if you sure. add in uh, uh, this company into the mix uh, I think they might be better off in, in the longer run but I think it is a bit of a red flag for everyone else out there that's a you know medium-sized producer that there may not be these lofty 50% premiums anymore as the market continues to, to, emer to, to evolve. Sure. Um, okay, so how do, you, uh, how do you sort of value the premium opportunity in the MSOs in the United States relative to the international landscape at this point? I mean, I've just been yeah. hearing a lot of, or observing a lot of uh, growing competition in the Latin American space, for example, mm -hmm. and I'm curious as to your, do you have any, any uh, uh, sort of sentiment towards Chiron Life Sciences, for example, who's our client, by mm -hmm. the way? Yeah, I think Chiron's a great company. Uh, we have another analyst, Kim Headland, out of Canaccord, who covers them. I think, for all, and I know they're not associated with the licensed producer, but I think a lot of the international uh, opportunities out there, whether it's LATAM, whether it's Germany, Europe, these are much, much, much larger opportunity sets than what the Canadian market is. And you mentioned MSOs. MSOs have sort of uh, optionality in more states uh, right. that they can add to their portfolio, and that's a smaller opportunity overall, but much, much more near term. So we saw another M&A uh, deal in the space between Harvest and Verano. That was uh, mm -hmm. one of the largest uh, deals you've seen in the space yet, and that puts them with the highest pro forma dispensary count. So although they're not in you know Germany, Latin America, and we don't have any, uh, any, any indication of when they might be an international company, if ever, for these MSOs, they have over 120 pro forma dispensaries now that are going to be built out over the next uh, year and a half, which is the most 
sort of vendor in the industry. So it's a little easier to get your head around. You can right. sort of benchmark it plus and minus it if you don't think they're gonna execute and that's up to any individual investor. But a lot of the international optionality that the licensed producers had and that Chiron has, it's a much longer road, right. uh, which means there's more risk associated with it. So I think the MSO trade, which has been over outperforming over the last couple weeks right now, is much more attractive in the near term, let's call it 2019. Sure, okay, so the the MSO trade is the most attractive for 2019. You sort of seem to have the impression that those international opportunities are bigger. I'm thinking of countries like Peru just announced yeah. its medical legislation. Peru's got 32 million people. There's nobody there servicing 32 million or whatever portion of the population 32 million would generate in terms of patients. Right. So are those opportunities that you think, yes, okay, MSO is now, but down the road, big sort of Latin American opportunities or big Euro European opportunities like that represented by the fact that a country like Peru has just gone legal? Absolutely. I mean, we're sort of in reverse order here in terms of where the opportunities are. So if you were to go five or ten years out, the biggest market in the world is going to be X North America medical, let's say, that's it, as, a, as, a, as a totality. So that's going to be the biggest market in the world. The second biggest market in the world is going to be the U.S., whether it's federally legal at that point or whether it's still state by state. And then the third, and in, in, in least the categories we're talking about, is going to be the Canadian market, right? right. So obviously everyone right now is looking for the, the highlights and in the earning statements. What are these LPs doing in Canada? And admittedly, there is some contribution in Germany, but that's really all we can track right now. Mm -hmm. And then second we can track is the MSOs and third is the international. So what we can see is actually a lot smaller than the overall opportunity out there. So there's going to be, uh, you know, I think a lot of great investment opportunities currently and in the future in markets like Peru or, you know, pick your, your international market. But the trouble with it today is you don't really know how it's going to get regulated. You don't know how it's going to be taxed. You don't know how um, incumbents or at least domestic uh, economies are going to be treated when it comes to rolling out those licenses versus allowing you know all these other you know publicly listed companies in Canada to come in so because of all of those unknowns there might be a huge opportunity on an EBITDA level but when you risk adjust for it it might not be really worth much today mm. uh, other than optionality and something that's great to cobble into an already an existing asset which is what many of the licensed producers have in Canada not a bad uh, not a bad strategy in my view to be let's say if you're canopy the number one uh, company in Canada in terms of the recreational market and then have all this international optionality that potentially could be supported by constellation involvement uh, down the road. Now, of course, with a company like Canopy, you pay for that today, right. uh, and there's varying degrees of that throughout the whole uh, opportunity set. Mm -hmm. Interesting. That's uh, quite, a, quite a great mm -hmm. and thorough uh, analysis. Um, okay, so then, what about in the, uh, you know, we've, we've seen Canopy Rivers and Canopy Growth are expanding their sort of uh, portfolio in Canada, which suggests to me that you know, the Canadian opportunity is not necessarily done yet, at least for the large incumbents. Um, I was kind of surprised to see them making such a big deal out of that, you know, the fact that they're going to be uh, so active in Eastern Canada. Mm -hmm. Well, there's still, I'd say there's still a lot to happen in the Canadian market when it comes to execution. Uh, I mean, I think there will be M&A, as I mentioned before, where players that might be, uh, you know, slightly lagging behind and others that want to increase their overall size and scale, it might make sense for them to pair up to get some efficiencies there. Mm -hmm. But there's not a lot of big ticket assets to buy, right? Right, right. now, it's more in the execution. Are you going to be able to get retail in Ontario, which I know is a, is a very difficult process right now? Are you going to execute in, let's say, a better market like Alberta? Uh, on the East Coast, I mean, it's obviously not overly material to the overall opportunity, but it still is a good niche to have. Mm -hmm. um, so I think there's more execution to happen in Canada, and I think a lot of the, the cash and the, uh, the balance sheets that, that, that still have hundreds of millions, and in Kronos and Constellation cases, you know, two and a half billion and five billion, um, there's a lot of cash that can still be deployed and a lot of stock that can still be issued, and I think most of the opportunity sets that that will be deployed to will be international markets, and I bet they'd love it if it was U.S. as well, but obviously right now it's not available to uh, TSX and NYSE listed companies. Sure. So the idea of riding a unicorn from infancy to billion dollar plus company mm -hmm. uh, in a short, relatively short time frame relative to other industries is still alive in your view in the international context, definitely in the U.S. context, selectively and in the Canadian context, very little is left for that massive value creation exercise yes. now that it's so mature. Yeah, I would say that um, the problem with, you know, riding the, the unicorn, as you say, up to whatever, you know, tens of billions of dollars of market capitalization is, um, there's still going to be turbulence on the way up, uh, assuming that these are going to be the winners on, on a global scale. Um, so as much as I think if Canopy, and I would just say, I'm just using them because they're the largest, if they end up being the global leader, I mean, there's multiple, you know, th there's two 
two, three, four, five times upside from where their valuation is today, which says a lot considering it's almost a $20 billion company. But on the way up, you know, you could easily see a 50% reset in the Canadian market this year, right? Because people are only going to wait so long. You know, you get two, three, four quarters into the recreational market. If Germany and other international markets aren't turned on, I mean, investor sentiment might go the other way. And in this sector, it can it can turn on a dime very, very sharply. So as much as I think the leaders in this space still have upside in valuation, I think all investors should be expecting at some point there is going to be a reset uh, onto the downside. But it's hard to know if that's going to happen from current levels or if they're going to go up another factor before that happens. Sure. Sure. And uh, one of the other events that I don't think we've had a chance to discuss in detail is uh, the uh, Aurora brought on Nelson Peltz mm -hmm. as an advisor, and yeah. that immediately added two to three billion dollars in market cap in the same week. Yeah. Um, do you think that's a, a, a reflection of a overreaction to Nelson Peltz's contribution, or do you think it's it's fair value, or do you think he's going to add a lot more to that yet? Well, it's hard to say it's fair value, uh, considering just the quantum of, you know, they have a billion shares outstanding and it jumped up $2. So, um, but I don't have an issue with it, and I'm not surprised that that happened, because one, Nelson Peltz brings a, 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 a breadth of experience in consumer goods, right? With with with, uh, with all of his exposure with Wendy's and, and other CPG companies over the years, uh, that's where this industry is going. Also, they disclosed, obviously, what the warrant strike price is, and I think people are, you know, jumping the gun a bit, saying, okay, well, if he's coming on board, he's coming on board to be successful, which he's a very successful uh, investor investor, then obviously that you know levels, so, so there's almost a self-fulfilling element to that and the stock price jumped up in, above it. But one thing I think it might telegraph um, that not a lot of investors are talking about, and again, I'm just speculating, is I don't believe someone like Nelson Peltz is coming on board for the Canadian opportunity. So that tells me he either A, believes, or it could be both, A, believes that the international optionality and what Constellation is doing is real, or B, eventually this is going to be brought to the US and maybe Aurora is going to be a vehicle that would be favored. So if, for whatever reason, licensed producers were allowed to get involved in the U.S., that's a great, then I think his, his value as a strategic investor is well worth whatever the accretion was in value that day. But admittedly, when the stock jumped up $2, obviously it's, it's a bit more an excitement than anything else, but sure. I'm absolutely not surprised. I thought there was a third option there, and that is that he's already got an idea in mind, and that bringing him aboard was just a way to formalize his compensation for an idea that Fair has enough. yet to be announced. That's all speculation, obviously. Could very well be. Yeah. yeah. All right, great, Matt. We'll leave it there for now. Thanks so much for your participation as usual. It was yeah. great, and we'll all have you back soon. Yeah, see you soon. Thanks very much.